it's great to be here. I, I never saw the ocean until I was 24, 25 years old. So every time I come up to the big water, it's a, it's a thrill all over again. They don't have this in Indiana. No, no, we're, we're kind of uh, short on oceans back in, <laughs> in Indiana. I'm on a two-week riding residency, uh, Mars riding residency, in the old Paul Mansion house. It's just beautiful. I'm there for two weeks, and I think at the end of my stay, they're going to have to peel me out of that place with the jaws of life. Wow. Wow. This is a candy store. Yes. Look at all this stuff. Oh wow, Evergreen Review. Holy smokes. That brings back happy memories. <laughs> William Burroughs. I just opened the page to William Burroughs. <laughs> we were talking about him a little while ago. Fantastic. Uh, Ezra Pound. Yeah, many mixed opinions about this dude. A genius, but a jerk as well. <laughs> You can be both. You can be both a genius and a jerk. You know, this place was brought back to the Writer's Center. Ralph Maud collected it. It's a facsimile library. It's everything that Olson read, wrote about, or talked about. And it is annotated in great detail by Ralph Maud, and that's what makes it so unique. That was a lot of work. Good grief. Oh, these cats, Baudelaire, Rimbaud. Crazy, the good kind of crazy. Um, I think um, Baudelaire and the um, the Psalms from the Bible are sort of the foundation of prose poetry. Here's the Bible <laughs> next to the home library and business manual. Exactly where I would put them. <laughs> You know, you could lock me in here for a couple of years and just airlift some uh, tied tick out once in a while, <laughs> and I think I'd be good. I'm so happy uh, to be here, and, and thank you, Henry, for your kind invitation. Um, we're fixing to hear some poetry. I'm going to share some of my own writing and maybe one or two of another uh, poet whose work I enjoy. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of poems that are related to the pandemic. This first one is Communion, Spring 2020. Do you remember the days when we'd all meet at some favorite restaurant? Stepping in from the cold, breathing clouds of garlic, shrugging off coats for the welcoming hugs. We'd examine the menu with the care of archaeologists blowing dust off a newly discovered Sanskrit tablet. And we'd sit so close, touching sometimes, passing platters back and forth, everyone yakking at once, pausing to join in a ragged chorus of happy birthday from a nearby table. And finally, as our ravaged plates made their way back to the kitchen, Sometimes we'd pose for a picture taken on someone's phone by an indulgent server, arms wrapped around each other, grinning like high school kids at graduation. Now those of us who live alone search cookbooks and computers for the dishes we make for one, post pictures of our creations online, not to brag, but to share communion the only way we can. something in the wind. A car waiting at the red light has a dog with head stuck out the window. Tongue hanging, snout twitching, beguiled by some intriguing smell. The average dog's nose is a million times more sensitive than a human's. A bloodhound's nose a hundred million times. This dog's a mutt, not a bloodhound. Genetic fruit salad. Uh, United Nations of Dog, but it has a fine nose and appears unconcerned about its lack of pedigree, focused instead on whatever it's sniffing, 
And it occurs to me there might not be a more contented creature on the planet than a dog with head stuck out a car window. The light turns green, the dog moves on to new olfactory adventures, and I wonder what it smelled here. What it smelled that I could never detect with this feeble human nose. Even if that nose weren't covered by this mask, I'm hoping will protect me from something in the wind I can neither smell nor see. I'm going to share a few poems about places, places we gather, or places we have gathered, and hope we can gather one time again. And this first one uh, is about a place that, um, a place where I wasn't welcome. This is for the ancient Boston bar with neon shamrocks in the windows, recently departed. Years ago, one rainy afternoon, I wandered into the bar looking for a payphone. Scattered in the gloom, a dozen pairs of eyes, as cold and hard as Irish granite, glanced up and settled on my dark skin. I know that in the proper circumstance, anyone there might have been delighted to crack my skull. Even so, I've seen enough of what I thought was mine slip away that when I pass their old haunt with its shiny new facade and the flock of brightly plumed young revelers whose mating calls fill the night, I can't help but feel a twinge. Loss makes brothers of us all. And I'll, I'll read that one now for one of my favorite, favorite, favorite poets, Billy Collins. Uh, this is, speaking of restaurants, an old man eating alone in a Chinese restaurant. I am glad I resisted the temptation when I was young, if it was a temptation, to write a poem about an old man eating alone at a corner table in a Chinese restaurant. I would have gotten it all wrong thinking, the poor bastard, not a friend in the world, and with only a book for a companion, he'll probably pay the bill out of a change purse. So glad I waited all these decades to record how hot and sour the hot and sour soup is here at Chang's this afternoon, and how cold the Chinese beer in a frosted glass. And my book, Jose Saramago's blindness, as it turns out, is so absorbing that I look up from its escalating horrors only when I am stunned by one of his gleaming sentences. And I should mention the light that falls through the big windows this time of the day, italicizing everything it touches, the plates and teapots the immaculate tablecloths, as well as the soft brown hair of the waitress in the white blouse and short black skirt. The one who is smiling now as she bears a cup of rice and shredded beef with garlic to my favorite table in the corner. I'm also a, a big fan of uh, Stephen Dunn, and this is Belly Dancer at the Hotel Jerome. Disguised as an Arab, the bazooki player introduces her as Fatima, but she's blonde, Midwestern, learn to move, we suspect, in continuing education. Hmm, Tuesdays, some hip college town. We're ready to laugh. This is Aspen, Colorado, cocaine and blue valium, the local hard liquor. And we, with snifters of Metaxa in our hands, part of the incongruous that passes for harmony here. But she's good. When she lets her hair loose, beautiful. So we revise mm, summer vacations, perhaps in Morocco, or an Egyptian lover, or both. This much we know. No Protestant has moved like this since the flames stopped licking their ankles. 
Men rise from dinner tables to stick dollar bills where their eyes have been. One slips a five in her cleavage. When she gets to us, she's dangling money with a carelessness so vast it's art. Something perfected, all her bones floating in milk. The fake Arabs on bongos and bazooki are real musicians, urging her, whispering, Fatima, Fatima, into the mic. And it's true. She has danced the mockery out of that wrong name in this unlikely place. She's Fatima, and the cheap, conspicuous dreams are ours rising now as bravos. This one, I'm, I'm always tempted when I read this poem to uh, editorialize, um, but I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just going to read the poem. Sometimes if you go to a, uh, like a slam or, or a spoken word event and someone's going through a long preamble to the poem, uh, you might hear someone in the crowd say, read the blah, blah, poem. Okay. So I'm going to read the blah blah poem. This is ceremony. In ancient times when I was young and strong, paid the rent painting houses. A certain diner was a favorite breakfast spot for those in the building trades. But one morning we arrived to find the doors wide open. No kitchen crew in sight, just a gang of laborers pallbearers in work boots, loading benches and coolers into a truck while we dazed regulars huddled in the cold. Somebody spit, shook his head. Gonna be a chicken joint, he muttered. How much chicken can you eat? Then we noticed downy feathers drifting to earth, looked up to see a red-tailed hawk perched under the eaves, enjoying its own breakfast a fat pigeon whose lifeless body jerked as the raptor fed. We stood on that sidewalk, transfixed by the bloody feast, tongue stilled on this ordinary morning by so much death, without warning or ceremony. Our hungry mouths open like the beaks of orphaned baby birds. I'm a um, big fan of, of climbing trees and picking fruit, or at least I was when I was younger. I think my climbing trees and picking fruit days are, are somewhat behind me. Um, but there are, are these bushes in, back in Indiana where I'm from called mulberry bushes and trees. And I think there are mulberries in parts of New England, but uh, they don't seem as common as they were back in the Midwest. This poem is mulberries. One day near the end of summer vacation when all the easily picked berries had been plundered, a few buddies and I climbed the tallest mulberry tree in Military Park on a dare to the highest branches that would support our weight. And lying back on sturdy limbs, lounging like the young lords, reached out to pluck those darkest berries beyond the reach of earthbound peasants. Our only competition, indignant birds who complained at our intrusion before flying off. With machine-like efficiency, we dispatched those berries, bursting with juice that dyed our lips and tongues and teeth purple, ran down our chins, eating our fill. Beyond our fill, we finally slowed, leaning back on our thrones in the sky. Down on the ground, the world carried on in the usual way. There was the distant cry of a baby in a carriage, the rumble of a truck like muted thunder, and all the while, creeping up like a slow-moving fog, the inevitability of sixth grade, of starched nuns and math homework, and one more step toward that distant, unimaginable adulthood. 
We had no words for any of this. We just felt it in our muscles, our bones. As golden light filtered through the leaves and late afternoon melted into early evening, we knew our mother stood on porches and back stoops, waiting to call us to the suppers for which we now had no room. The hard branches had begun to punish our backs, and the rough bark chafed our skin. So on some silent signal, like birds changing course mid-flight, we began our descent, coming down more carefully than we climbed, returning reluctantly to the ordinary world. I spent some time um, on Mission Hill in Boston a couple of years ago. I was um, an artist in residence for the city of Boston, and I, I really got to love that neighborhood. I, I, I knew a lot about it before, but doing this residency up there, it really, uh, I really got hooked on it. And I wrote this, uh, among other things about that experience, I wrote this poem, The Bells of the Basilica, for Mission Hill Church. When the bells of the basilica toll the hour, a river of sound flows down Tremont Street. It flows over the donut shop, the pizza parlors, the post office, the hardware store. It flows over the Asian woman who sits waiting for the bus, her ancient wrinkled face, the map of a world to which she will never return. It flows over teenaged girls released from the bondage of school, who chatter in Spanish like colorful landlocked birds. It flows over the college man who wanders into traffic staring at his phone. The bells of the basilica toll for believers and non-believers alike, for the loved and the lonely, for those whose stories are just beginning and those whose stories are closer to the end. The river of sound washes over everyone and everything on the miracle of this most ordinary day. And this is another kind of prayer. Um, it's called prayer. In a quiet corner of the supermarket parking lot, an employee in a red t-shirt kneels on a piece of cardboard, bows, then rises to speak the holy words. His view of Mecca unimpeded by the dumpster and unpainted wooden fence. A Mosque of One. Uh, before I retired uh, from the State Arts Council, the, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, it's going, it's going on six years now, I don't know how that's possible, but I used to ride the train to work every day. And at one point there was an experience that made me go, no, I can't believe that happened. But then it, uh, it started happening more and more often. And I realized that I had to write about it. So I, I, I wrote this poem about it. It's um, sonnet for the young woman who offered me her seat on the train. <laughs> <laughs> Your smile illuminates the gloomy morn as sunlight warms a chilly mountain lake. Before me sits a beauty not yet born when decades trail already in my wake. You stir as if to rise and yield your place, but I return your smile and shake my head while hoping in the moment that my face will show no hint of all the thoughts unsaid. I could have sung your mother lullabies. Yet still, a young man lingers in my heart who once delighted at a young girl's size. The time has passed for him to play that part. 
He read his lines upon a perfumed stage, but as they will, the years have turned the page. When um, I was working on that poem, I usually work in pre-verse, um, unmetered, but I, I wasn't working when I tried to write about that in that format. And I realized that it needed to be a sonnet. It needed to be a sort of formal, old-fashioned, romantic, almost love song. And um, so that's, uh, that's what it became. It's interesting how when you're trying to do any kind of poem, you, you're looking at uh, you're looking at the tool you need to do the job. Stephen King in his wonderful book uh, on writing is one of my favorite books about the craft of writing. Not about poetry, but you know it's about writing, it's about creativity in general. Uh, he said you use the tool to do the job you're trying to do, and uh, that's always a, an interesting process when you're writing, you're, you're solving puzzles, you're always solving puzzles. This is uh, sort of a little short story, actually. Um, another, another poem about people gathering, people working together. Um, not that long ago, you know, 150 years or so ago, most people in this country lived, uh, lived on farms or at least they didn't live in big cities. And when you, when you were in a farm community, uh, you, you couldn't survive unless you helped each other because there were things you could do by yourself. Like you could build your own home, you could build your own barn. So people you, you didn't know, you didn't like, you didn't know, you would uh, go to their barn raisings. And this is uh, sort of a parable, if you will. Uh, it's called the barn raising. Last month, heat lightning struck my neighbor's barn. We were in a dry spell, and the barn burned like a pile of kindling. Fire lit the night sky for miles. Morning rose on a pile of charred timbers. I know my neighbor from church. When his barn raising was announced as Sunday service, he sat stiff-necked and rigid as if the lightning bolt were proof he'd failed God's judgment. The day of the raising was blessed with a clear blue sky. Lumber had been hauled in the week before, walls and rafters all assembled, lying ready on the ground. And so, fifty men began to dance. Their fathers danced, and their fathers, and theirs. Slowly the frame took shape. At last he climbed the final rafter and nailed a branch of Norway spruce. The pastor said a prayer. My neighbor raised his hammer like a sword. A cheer rang through. At the clearing's edge, a stand of oak trees spilled birds into the sky. I think I'll share another couple of poems with you. Uh, this, this one is about childhood, and it's the poem that ends, um, ends my book of poems titled All Sins Forgiven, Poems for My Parents. Um, this is Christmas night, 1957. Grandma's house was packed with family and friends. All orbiting a dining room table, jammed with cakes, pies, cookies, a clove-studded honey-glazed ham, a bronze turkey slightly smaller than a baby pterodactyl, and at the center of the star of the show, a gigantic crystal bowl that appeared but once a year with a half-gallon chunk of vanilla ice cream floating in a lake of Grandma's eggnog. It had always been Grandpa's job to stir in a fifth of Kentucky bourbon. But for the first time, this ritual was performed by one of his sons, Uncle Roy, perhaps, or Uncle Albert, I don't remember which. But I remember Grandpa's oxblood leather easy chair, empty this year for the first time, keeping a silent watch on the proceedings. At five, I had no yardstick to measure the hole that chair created in my mother's childhood home. 
I was too busy weaving through the forest of grown-up legs for another piece of pie. Finally, with the children overtired and sugar-crazed, our coats and hats were gathered and the exodus began. All night the spiked nog had been off limits to my sister and me, but the taste we were allowed just before leaving made us easier to load into the car. On the ride home while I dozed in the back seat, our station wagon was the world. Warm as a womb, the faithful engines hum, and drifting from the front, a lullaby, the murmur of our parents' voices. And I'll, I'll end with one that ends my latest book, uh, Memento Mori. And this is, this is a poem that maybe is of some relevance or, or, or help to, to us in a time when a lot of things have ended and maybe we're hoping that some other things will begin. So this is a, a prayer, if you will, for starting something. It's called Every New Thing. Every new thing is an act of treason, a betrayal of the comfortable, the familiar. An animal that is known only the cage will cringe in the corner if the door suddenly swings open, squealing on ancient rusted hinges. If I have but one wish for you, for me, for us all, it's to remember that our own cages are locked only by the fear of change. That we have the power to shove those doors open, to take one step, then another, into a new world. Charles, I wish we had a lot of people in the room here, but... Someday we will. Someday we will. Yeah. Thank you very much for your offerings. We My pleasure. It. My pleasure. And thanks for your, your hospitality. Charles takes us out with the sound of one of the world's oldest instruments, the didgeridoo.